the governor of the state of Illinois has declared a gubernatorial disaster proclamation in response to the COVID-19 outbreak and all of the village Glendale Heights is covered by the disaster area. In light of the ongoing COVID-19 outbreak, the village president of the village of Glendale Heights has determined that an in-person meeting for the January 29, 2022 special village board meeting is not practical or prudent in light of the disaster. All of the trustees of the village of village board participating in the January 29, 2022 special uh, village board meeting, wherever their physical location shall be verified and determined that they can hear one and other and can hear all discussion and testimony during the meeting. Sign Jodri M. A. Cooker, village president of the village of Glendale Heights, dated January 29, 2022. I would like to call this special village board meeting of Saturday, January 29, 2022, to order. Will the deputy clerk please take the role? Thank you, Mayor. President yes. Coker? Yes. Trustee Schmidt, he's excused for a family event. Trustee Siddiqui, not here. Trustee Light? Here. Trustee Maritato? Here. Trustee Pojak? Here. Trustee Schroeder? Absent. She's on her way. Okay. Uh, please stand and join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag I would like to start this special board of January 29 with a special thank you to the village board members, executive staff, and all sports staff for taking time on this Saturday to be part of this special board meeting. I want to also thank you, the residents, for taking time on, the, on this Saturday to attend this meeting, either in person or on Zoom. This is truly what local government is about working with president to achieve common goals. I sincerely appreciate all the efforts my fellow board members and the executive staff have put into being prepared for our upcoming budget. <coughs> the purpose of this meeting is to allow our residents to have a voice into the village and to assist our executive staff and elected leaders as we plan for the future and prepare for our upcoming budget process. Thank you, and we will now go to public discussion agenda item. Next is public discussion of agenda item. Is there anyone in the public that would like to address this board on an agenda items? So, Mayor, if I could just for a yes. second. Yes. Uh, as we go through this meeting, uh, thank you for all for being here on behalf of uh, all the staff that are here. We appreciate you being here on a Saturday and taking time out of your day to come share your thoughts with us on how we proceed within the village. Uh, but we have a two-hour time limit. Uh, we're happy to stay after this two-hour time limit to answer any questions you have and to talk to you uh, individually. But just for the sake of timeliness, we've put a two-hour time limit on this meeting. Uh, also, any person who wants to come up and speak, on any topic that's on the agenda, which pretty much covers anything that you want to talk about. Uh, five minutes by local rules uh, per person. And if there's a give and take between uh, us as far as questions or presentations, then we'll extend that as needed. But generally speaking, it's a five minute rule on talking. So whomever would like to address the, the village on any agenda item uh, that's there uh, on this agenda this morning, uh, we can form a line behind the podium, and we can all work through it. Come on up, sir. So all you have to do is state your name. We do not need your address. 
uh, per rules, we just need your name. Hello, my name is Alamdar Zaidi. Um, I have a question regarding this uh, cricket field is being given to the one person every year. Uh, I'm not against the person, you know, like why he's getting every year, but it, it has to be public, you know. Anybody can participate, and it's not like uh, each year he is getting the field uh, permission, you know, uh, from you know from inside, and from so many years he's the only person getting the cricket field. Uh, it has to be open to the public. Whoever wants to bid higher, that person supposed to be getting that. Okay. Yeah, that's my guy. Thank you. Anybody else? Good morning. My name is Sayed Afsarullah. Um, I'm, I'm here just to you know, get some insight about, you know, I am an investor and uh, I have some properties in Glendale Heights. Uh, I have noticed that, you know, the process of um, uh, inspection is pretty lengthy and uh, some of the things are very unusual. So I just wanted to bring it in front of the board that, you know, is there anything you can do to reduce those tasks because it is, it is becoming very hard for us to invest here. Uh, you know, if at one point, you know, maybe we will decide to move out and invest in some other city. So I just want to bring this and uh, discuss with the board. Thank you. Uh, inspection process as to rental properties or business properties? Uh, rental properties. Mr. Van, do you want to answer? Um, would you like? Yeah, please. Uh, do you want this all at the beginning? Or it's fine. Okay. okay. Um, I, so the village of Glendale Heights has approximately 1,500 rental properties uh, for single family rental. If you have specific addresses, I'm, I'm happy to discuss it with you. Uh, just the, the general process is the rental licenses are due February 1st. Uh, and then we schedule the rental inspections throughout the year uh, after that. And then we have landlord training sessions uh, four times a year as well. We do have a standard list of items that we inspect for to keep the, the properties safe as well as the tenants safe. So if you have a, certainly if you um, want to provide me an address, I can look up or I'm happy to talk to you about your specific issue. Uh, so we have a pretty standard process we did. Uh, have uh, now changed to instead of a letter, we now do invoicing to try to make it a little easier for people to understand the process. But I'm, I'm happy to talk to you specifically. Yeah, just, I mean, some unreasonable items that are in the list that I don't think I mean, is required for inspection. You know, so I can discuss with you. Okay. Know. Yeah. I mean, if you have yeah, what is what you believe to be unreasonable, I'm, I'm happy to talk to you about it. Thank you so much. Sure. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Christopher Epstein. I'm just going to run down a few things that I'd like to discuss a little bit of. Glendale Heights Fest, I'm hoping to see it back in full strength this year. The only thing that I have a concern with is the amount of excessive drinking and the cars up and down Fullerton Avenue. The last time we had a full festival, there was some speeding, weaving, going around cars. So I hope we have enough uh, police presence at, you know, at the end of the festivals to control that traffic coming in and out. And if anybody does appear to be impaired, to have them pulled over and, and given a breathalyzer test. Um, next thing, cricket. I agree with the previous uh, person discussing on one person getting it. The board is the one here that voted that contract in. So I just want to let everybody know with regards to it. Um, hopefully, it will be an open bid. We lost probably at least $10,000 worth of revenue to the village because of one person uh, getting the cricket and for all these years all you know all that excessive income we could have gotten or recouped especially with in light of a uh, increase in our property taxes potentially uh, finance department I talked with Bill polling before I mentioned to him with regards to uh, outstanding checks that were made payable to the village of Glendale Heights that are within the uh, treasurer of the state of Illinois. They've been out there at least seven years because that's the amount of time it takes before the money is sent to the state. That is checks that have been made payable to the village that have not been cashed, either lost or anything like that. There is a number of them out there. You can find it on the uh, Dash for Cash website and just type in Village of Glendale Heights. 
Uh, and you can see all the checks that are there. Some of them are for other businesses in Glendale Heights, but there's a good number of them that are payable to the village of Glendale Heights that are in excess of seven years. Uh, police, I discussed with Chief earlier today. I brought up an idea of having uh, the safety town turn into a picture place for uh, Santa Claus for the kids during the holiday season, where they can, can come there, have pictures taken with Santa Claus, and maybe a, as a fee, a donation to the Make-A-Wish Foundation. So we can raise some funds for a good cause that helps our community itself and um, go from there You know, with that. I talked to Keith a little bit earlier today uh, under Parks and Recreation with regards to potentially a golf dome. Maybe we can generate some more revenue out of the golf course, having some type of dome, dome facility. I know it's an expensive issue and things like that but I would like to um, possibly see that to generate more revenue, um, not only for the, the golf dome, but maybe have a, a kid's area in front of it, you know, in, inside of it, and during the daytime on Saturdays or something, have mini golf there for the kids. Um, purchasing, I'd like to see these uh, bids going out to multiple, uh, and actual, uh, multiple play, uh, play people or companies for our projects and everything like that. I don't know what the standard limit is uh, before you start asking for a bid, but we've had a lot of no-bid contracts in the past that, that we need to break that cycle and stop just giving our town away to anybody. And uh, last thing I want to bring up is the potential cannabis facility within the uh, village. I'd like to see the um, tax revenue. Uh, District 16 is the very in need of tax revenue with regards to the lack of business that we have in uh, that school district. I know it's a hot topic with cannabis, but if any revenue comes into this town, if it's in District 16 uh, site or whatever, that's fine. If it's in District 15, I'd like to see the tax revenue split between 15 and 16 with regards to um, this uh, the revenue that would be generated by the taxes. Uh, one other thing I did here over the weekend, there was some type of incident on, in District 15 with a child or something like that, a Muslim faith or whatever, um, being bullied. I hope that can be addressed too. I know that's generally the school district's issue, but if you haven't heard about it, there was some issue with a child over District 15. I thank you for your time. You have a good day. Thank you, Mr. Jefferson. Hi, good morning, everybody. You, you all know who I am. Uh, I've been around here for a long, long time, close to 60 years. Mike Somerville, state your name, please. Mike Somerville, Thank yes, you. okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Um, first of all, I want to address District 16 is not hurting for money. We, we just abated taxes to the people of Glendale Heights. And if all else works out, we will soon be doing that again. So, I mean, I, Mr. Epstein, I know you were a former uh, uh, board member. We are not hurting for money. Well, for the record, any this, sales tax revenue generated from any establishment in town doesn't go to the school district, so. Correct. So, I mean, um, I'm also the school board president for District 16, so. Um, I do want to, I'm not here to tell you how to run your board, uh, far be it for me to do that, but I've been watching a couple of your board meetings, and I think you all need to get together and work together, or having, we, when we have new board members, we come and have a training session with all our executive uh, members, our board members, and we have a little retreat, and we have little things to work together. Um, I don't know if you're doing that. I, again, I'm not suggesting you do that, but I think, you know, a lot of people on the social media and everything else think this is, is wrong, What's, what we're seeing in the board meetings, okay? Sniping. Like I said, I've been here for 60 years, and I've seen a lot of boards. A lot of you have been on boards a long time, and uh, Mr. Pojak. You point to a sign that's no longer there at a one village meeting, and you, you kindly hit something with me. You said, proud and progressive. Maybe we need to change our 
uh, slogan. You remember that? Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. But let's let's talk about the real reason. Um, as personal, again, this is not District 16. This is not here as a village resident. I'm against having two, and I repeat, two marijuana distributors in our town. Okay, I, I've been around for a long time, and I've seen that the village is not becoming family friendly anymore. We're not doing enough. We're not getting involved. I was at the planning commissioning, and a couple of them said. Well, it's up to the parents. No, it's up to the village and the school district to help raise the kids. <coughs> Bless you, Mary. <coughs> but again, I'm not seeing that. I'm not seeing the passionate stuff that it used to be. It's not friendly, okay? We don't have a lot of stuff. We are not hiring people that have the expertise and stuff. Getting stuff into our village, again, it's been eight years or more since I ran for the village board. My big thing is we don't have family-friendly restaurants in this town. We have fast food. We, you know, I don't need fast food. I don't need to get any fatter. But we just sit there and we don't do anything. We're not a progressive. We're not doing stuff to go after businesses in our town. And I'm saying we hire people not because of what they know, but we're hiring people that don't have expertise about bringing business into our town. Hiring people to go and look at what we need in this town. We have a lot of vacant buildings in our town. We don't get out there and we don't talk to the developers and say, listen, or we don't promote people to come into our town to be Progressive. Now, you may think I'm all an old codgery old man, but I, I think about it. I've seen the village. I've seen where it came from. Okay? I don't think we're being family friendly. We're not getting involved. We're not getting stuffed thing. And the thing I just heard today, over $300,000 for a dog park? That's crazy. We have to be fiscal responsible to our residents of Glendale Heights. Am I afford a, fall, a dog park? Yes, I am. Okay, I used to have two beautiful dogs. I only have one now. But I like to take them to the dog park. I like to play. You go over to uh, some place, they charge you. Yeah, it's a, it's a minimal, folks. But it, it, I still have to drive. I still have to go for gas. I have to do this. But the village needs to be responsible and fiscally responsible. $350,000 for a dog park? That's ridiculous. We need to be for our people. And like I said, I've been around here a long time, and I'm not seeing us being friendly to our families. We're not inviting people. We're not holding meetings. We're not getting out there. Yes, we have uh, breakfast with the Easter Bunny. Yes, we have with the Santa Claus. Okay? We don't have, like other towns, festivals or music in the park, or many things that have planned. And that's, I, I think it might be because we don't have a person that is responsible. Their main job is to go out and get that business, or get that, run that event. Now, I, I'm, I'm probably gonna exceed my minutes. But I started I'm, you late, Mike, so I gave you an extra minute and a half. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> but again, I think that we need to work together. I think the board needs to work together. And if you need to work, I, I understand it. I, I, board meetings and everything, all I see is fighting. Yes, it's always like that when a new regime comes in. But again, I've seen it with other village presidents. Work together, get together and try a little to work the things, to become a board for the people. Be, again, proud and progressive. I don't know where it disappeared to, Jester. But I like, you know, I know all you people. I know where you guys come from. you got a bigger heart than me. No, I don't think you got a bigger heart than me because I wouldn't be involved in the stuff I'd be. I spent 33 years as a police officer and 20-something years on the, uh, school. the school board. <laughs> I love kids. I'm still coaching wrestling at my age. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Mike. 
Thank Thanks, you. Mike. Could I ask him a question? Um, Ms. Uh, do you want to respond dog or you know, how much money it is? So we have a uh, feasibility study that will be uh, part of the budget process for about $14,000. That feasibility study will um, kind of dictate what final costs are, uh, proper place for the uh, park within the areas that we might have available in town. And that's going to take a few months to do once it's approved. And also grants. Yeah, so there's also some grants out there that uh, could help offset some of the costs. Uh, in the current budget, we have money uh, put in the budget, uh, about $150,000 to start the park. So that's where that's at. Uh, nobody knows what the final cost is until we get the feasibility study from the engineers on what that cost is. And a lot's, a lot's going to depend on if there's a location in town uh, that uh, doesn't need a lot of work, that's pretty flat already, that though we don't need tree removal or deforestation or it's not part of some other um, uh, wetland or something like that. So it all depends on what the engineers come up with as far as location and how much is gonna, infrastructure is going to take to develop the park. Joanne, uh, I was in the impression that we are doing pretty good with businesses moving in town. Yes, actually, uh, thank you. May I uh, address, thank you. Um, I just want to address that a little bit. I am the person responsible for economic development. It, I, it is a small part of my job. I also am responsible for rental, real estate, code enforcement, building permits, and a variety of other duties. So uh, to, I guess, defend myself a bit on that, uh, I also have a uh, economic development certification. So the village is doing quite well. Uh, we have uh, spent a significant amount of time on the North Avenue corridor, and over the past uh, seven, eight years, we've done we've worked with developers in DuPage County and DuPage County Forest Preserve to annex 990 East North Avenue, and have Coda Resources has moved in there. They, due to their experience with the Village of Glendale Heights, they've now just advised us last week that they are uh, adding an additional. Uh, you, uh, additional building at 1 East North Avenue. They're leasing about another $37,000, I'm sorry, 37,000 square feet because of their experience in the village that they want to remain in the village and expand to an additional location. Uh, we also worked with the developer at um, for assemblage at 760 East North Avenue. ML Realty in that building has been built, again, due to their uh, how, how good their experience was with Glendale Heights. They also assembled all the property on Cavalry Drive and Army Trail Road, have redeveloped that. That's been consolidated. And two new buildings are under construction right now, uh, two new business park buildings. And the rear building has already been leased for Clyde's Donuts. Uh, Doug and Rachel and, and I and the Village Board have all worked very hard on getting Clyde's Donuts to move forward, which is a, a major improvement for that. Uh, United Dock and Door has, was at 2000 Bloomingdale Road. They've been very successful. They're now moving over to 380 Windy Point, again, staying within the community. So our reputation of working with businesses have really helped. All these businesses have decided to either expand or relocate within the village. Uh, on a more commercial note, we have a permit in right now. Aldi Foods, uh, the grocery store, is doubling in size, so they're going to be expanding uh, as well. And we have some restaurants. Uh, they're, I guess, uh, not sit down. We're still working on that. That's a challenge. But uh, Buns on Fire is moving in. Wingstop moved in. And then we have a couple other uh, business expansions, Convenience Valet, Premier Packaging. Uh, we're working with the brokers. Uh, I talked to a broker yesterday, actually, about some additional assemblage on North Avenue because that is still a very hot market, the North Avenue corridor. So uh, it's an opportunity to give you a little update on where we are with economic development. We had businesses move into 1 East North Avenue? Uh, yeah, uh, DH Pace has right. moved in. And Bill Poling, our finance director, Bill, if you have the numbers on um, where our uh, revenues have been for the last four or five years, and then uh, how our uh, overall fund has increased. Well, I just want to mention that over the last 
six years, the sales tax revenue from the village, which is a, a major component of the total revenue for the village, has gone from six point four million in twenty fifteen to eight point two million in twenty twenty one. And I think that despite the impact of the pandemic in not just Glendale Heights, but in the country in general, to be able to represent that sales tax growth actually occurred in a year where everything was basically shut down for a period of time is phenomenal. And I think that's kudos to the board for being visionaries and bringing in the right businesses. Kudos to community development for attracting businesses that are tax generators. And it's a complement to the, to the mix of retail establishments that are in the village. Automobile dealerships, we've got big box warehouses, we've got grocery stores and home improvement centers. And you know, having the right mix in the climate that we were in, I think is just phenomenal. And where's our general fund at in relation to that sales tax? We've added $10 million to our, to our savings? In the fiscal year that was just completed in 2021, yes, the general fund of the village, which is our rainy day fund, grew by approximately $4.5 million for unreserved, unrestricted purposes, right. which is the equivalent of more than eight months' worth of reserves. So if you had a catastrophe in the community, then you would have funds on hand to be able to support expenditures for up to eight months. So in excess of your, of your policy and in excess of what the GFOA requires. So the, the village has uh, gone through the pandemic well with the Home Depot, Menards, Target, and even car dealerships. Uh, we, we've seen increase in revenues through the pandemic and not a decrease like many other communities have, right? So nobody knows what the future of car dealerships is with supply chain and chips and computers and everything else. Uh, but we have no control over that. Uh, certainly Home Depot, Menards, Target, Jewel, Aldi have done phenomenal through the pandemic and will continue to do so as we come out of the pandemic because they're the staples of uh, people's kind of everyday shopping for stuff. So the village is in a good spot from a economic uh, sales tax perspective. Uh, once cars come back in the lots, all those people waiting to buy cars will buy cars. So we're set up very well with Nissan, Chevy, and Dodge. Amongst the uh, three or four uh, internet car sales that we have that do maybe more business than our actual big dealerships uh, through the internet car sales. So the village is set up actually to, to work through pandemics like we have and come out stronger. And I think as <laughs> 2022 and 23 and 24 come around, we'll be even in a better financial picture from a sales tax revenue, which is a big part of our, our operating budget, to continue providing your programming and services. Uh, Mike, I hear you. Uh, some good idea on a couple things. I appreciate that. Uh, there is uh, something that's we've already planned in our head for future uh, with some of those things. Uh, Summerfest was brought up twice. Uh, Keith, you want to talk about Summerfest? Sure. I can give a brief update on Summerfest. We had our actual kickoff meeting for the 2022 uh, Fest on uh, earlier this week. Fest is planned for five days from July 13th through the 17th. Uh, we have already started our um, entertainment and getting food vendor information out, um, looking at a similar layout to last the last time we did it, which is hard to imagine, it's been three years since we had Fest, um, but we're still looking to work with the bump out for the younger kids that was at the last Fest and are working our way through the process. So our plan is to um, move forward with Fest in the way that it has been done in years past. Um, obviously, we haven't done it for a few years, so we'll make any changes that are necessary as we go through the process. But um, we're ready to get the residents back and give them a festival that they will certainly enjoy in the middle of July. So we already have our band scheduled, all the entertainment scheduled. Uh, we're planning. We had our first kickoff meeting uh, this week to plan for Summerfest. We're planning on a full five-day fest. Um, so that's all in the plans as it stands today. Uh, when it comes to uh, other entertainment, 
Uh, Mayor, we're having Pakistani uh, Cultural Day again. Yes. In August. Uh, yes, August. We're I also that's going with the, you know uh, Mexican. Yeah. Or, we're also planning Hispanic Independence and, Day, Mexican Independence and Day, Indian Independence Day too. In Indian Independence Day. So Glendale Heights is a multicultural uh, community, as you all know. So working with all of our cultures is important to the board and to the residents and to the staff. So we have multicultural events coming on throughout the summer. Uh, those were put off the last couple of years uh, in their biggest form because of the pandemic. Uh, Keith, what other events we have? Well, we also have Oktoberfest, so I want to make sure to mention that. We did um, run a DJ in the park last summer. Um, I know that you mentioned uh, concerts and stuff like that. So we started and tried to DJ in the park. We're looking at different options for that for this summer. Um, so yeah, I, those are just some of the events that we've got going. Keith, are we still doing a movie with a cop also? I'll turn that one over to George. Yes, we're going to run that once a month uh, in the summer months like we did last year. How were the turnouts for all those with the residents? It was uh, on and off, so when you know, it goes by weather. So at the end, yeah. or later ones when it was really cold out, we didn't have many people. But prior to that, we did. It was a good short turnout. The first, good short. the first two were over 100 people there. Oh, wow. That's quite a, that's good a turnout then. So it is reaching quite a few people. Because I know we do a lot of different things with National Night Out, uh, park parties, our Easter Bunny, breakfast with even Santa, um, community garage sales. We are planning to do that again. We'll do it in conjunction with the, um, the show and shine car show, yes. Yes. And I know we did quite a bit. I, liked, I, I agree with Mike. I always like to do more, you know, anything to bring in, you know, the families together. I mean, that's important. It really is. He's 100% right. So, uh, uh, in Chester? Yeah, uh, Mike, I just want to do, uh, Doug, I mean, this is for Mike. Uh, send me after the meeting. Uh, regarding the dog park, we had a special board meeting about four months ago, and that was brought, I had a brochure that I checked with the Glen Ellen Park District. The do's and the don'ts, they have a lot of, lot of issues. Hey, Chester, you want a copy of that? I got it. I got one right here. Got it? Okay, I don't know if you need so it. So you got to move your... I can't thing. move it today. Oh, okay. And um, they had a lot of issues. I don't know the initial cost for them to set it up, but the liability is number one. The land acquisition, fencing, <clears throat> maintenance. It, it's on and on and on. I have something for you that would be quite helpful. Chester, I have that. Yeah, I got it from Glen Ellen. Is that the one you got? We're not Glen Ellen. I know, I know. And I'm trying to get one from Carol Stream, too. Mike, would you mind coming up so we can hear at you? The, at the meeting, we all voted against it to put it on a back burner. Thank you. So in addition to the dog park, we also have uh, parks for families and kids to put in uh, that... It was ongoing as part of our development and growth. Uh, Keith, you want to talk about some park sure. developments? Well, I think that one of the things that uh, we have been looking at is where our next park will go or what, um, where we think the next park um, should go. And the next park that we've out designated out as a place to do it is the, what we call the Simons property. It's the property right off of Spruce. Um, we actually received a DCO grant um, a couple years back for about $144,000, and the hope is is that it, it was set up, set up to also be a connection to the Great Western Trail. So we're looking into, um, in the upcoming budget, putting money in to get a designer of a park to take a look at the different options that we can do in that area. Um, it's kind of one of our more underserved areas, so we want to make sure that we're kind of doing that. Everybody knows where that is. It's behind, kind of behind the Shorewood townhome apartment area. So um, trying to get that as one of our next areas. Um, so we'll be working on that. We also have identified a couple of other areas of town where we might be able to put some additional uh, playground equipment um, or bring back some playground equipment. One of those areas includes uh, the Gladstone Park area. We took out some equipment that was there. We did a lot of work to put in a new walking path and everything, but we've designated an area out there that uh, we think will make for a great playground area. Can we take next person, please? 
We have a comment by Gail Dolan regarding Glendale Heights Fest. She said, ending hours should be 10 p.m. on weeknights and 11 p.m. on Friday and Saturday. This may help with excessive drinking and undesirable groups coming later in the evening. She realizes that this may cut into profits, which go towards fireworks, but maybe just eliminate the Wednesday evening fireworks. Anybody else on Zoom right now? No. Uh, any other public comments? We'll continue with some other topics that we'll talk about. No? Uh, Keith, this is kind of like your little morning, so. Great. It's my lucky day. Uh, you want to, uh, some of the other areas that we talked about, just to kind of give an, a quick update, and some of you have probably seen the updates on a few of these things. Camera Park, uh, we're in the process of, um, completing that project, it should be finished in the spring. We still need to put in some educational components. Um, we're finishing up the fitness area, the challenge course, and then the building, which houses the controls for the splash pad. Um, the playground area is actually completed, has been, um, the grass is growing around it, and we're looking forward to opening that up earlier in the spring and doing a kind of a grand opening for the entire park, hopefully Memorial Day weekend. We just need to coordinate that with schedules with the, uh, with the board. Um, and then another item is that's um, gotten a lot of conversation in the past is community garden. Um, community garden is still being worked on. Uh, Mr. Somerville, uh, we're continuing to work with District 16 to get that accomplished. Uh, we have a plan. We have a committee that has been meeting since October on a monthly basis except for the month of January, uh, to get rules, regulations, and ideas put together because our hope is that when the, the winter is over and the spring hits, we'll be able to move land and get the stuff set up and ready to go. Um, our, our hope is still to have that ready to go for the uh, late spring of 2022. And then uh, update on camera park and all the developments going on to camera? Uh, in addition, in addition to what I had already mentioned, um, I, one of the things I want to make sure everybody knows is I've gotten a lot of questions about the Frisbee golf. Everybody sees the Frisbee golf people out there. Make sure you check out. Um, there's tea signs and everything. All that stuff will be removable so that we are able to uh, utilize that area during fest. So there was a lot of concern I've heard about that. But yeah, um, Camera Park will also have um, uh, a Monarch Butterfly Way Station. We have a lot of different things that will be added to that as we go, in addition to the work that we've already done for the Camera Park project. Yeah. At Community Park, we didn't discuss anything at the park, at the park meetings about parking or I mean, what, what, what are we doing with that? Correct. So that'll all be a part of the discussion that we would have to do with an outside vendor to come up and see if we even have the parking available for that area. So all that will be a part of the process. You'll actually see that at the next Parks and Rec Committee, just a layout of what we're looking at. Um, and then we'll obviously bring the public and the committee and the board and everybody involved so that we can get what the most for our bang for our buck and, and do something that will really fit that area of the community. All right, thanks, Keith. Yes, Mr. Wilson. Keith, uh, for you again, too. Do we still have that little box over by the library where people can drop off books and pick up new books, et cetera? So we have we, one over at our yeah, park. Yeah, so you have one over by your park. We did not put one in by Camera Park, but I've been working with the library. We've actually added one. Oh, I. I gotta be one at There's one at Nazos. That's right. The one we put one by the playground in Nazos. Um, we've actually been in contact with the library. Uh, we've worked in conjunction with them. They are actually the ones that have been uh, supporting the boxes after we build them. We've had no problems, and they've been a great hit. So I know that there's talk about putting one just on the, just outside the library by Camera Park, and we'll be looking at other locations as well. All right. Have you had any issues with the one by me in my? Park. Um, the only issue we had is at one point the door fell off and we're oh, not okay. sure if it got pulled off, but honestly, they have been, um, something that have been very well received in the community. All right. Thanks, Keith. You're welcome. Yes. Oh, I just, sorry. I just got, I have a communication online, Nicole, you know, it's kind of strange. Um, Colette had just sent me a message. Um, 
wanted to talk about, um, she wanted me to mention something about an outdoor ice rink, like we used to have at Camera Park, how she thought that was kind of nice, didn't know what happened to it, so she was questioning that. Uh, in regards to like plowing for streets, she was curious if we can get closer to curbs at a, a sooner time than we normally do. Um, uh, clearing sidewalks along Fullerton for the parks and the kids going to school. She was concerned with that, if it's possible to do earlier. I know it's hard with all that. And then um, talk about food trucks during the summer, like doing a food truck festival uh, at Camera Park. Um, she thought these would be real good ideas, and she asked if I could please bring them up in today's meeting. Thank you, Colette. I like the food truck idea. Well, the food truck idea. Me too. I have Gail Dolan again. Um, she just wants you to reiterate when Camera Park will be done. Uh, Camera Park is expected to be completed in the spring. I'm hoping by the end of April, but it's all weather dependent. Um, we're hoping that we'll be able to open up, um, do a grand opening around the Memorial Day weekend. But if we can get the park open before that, um, I think that's what the plan is, is to get it open. We're not going to wait for that time, but we can't turn on the, I don't want to turn on the um, splash pad until that point. Anybody else from, yes. Yeah, uh, you can please come over here. Oh. Can you just state your name, sir? I'll bring up my mic. delinquency and all that stuff and the kids really did a nice job there and it was used it was used daily during the summertime it was really well used and then we finally got the other basket for a full court um, even the police helped out the guys are finishing a game it was late and it was after dusk and one of the police cars turned around so his lights were on the basket so the guys could finish their game it was kind of cool <laughs> also uh camera our uh, omen park we got swings coming keith correct that is correct we got swings coming, and they're supposed to be in spring, as, uh, in the springtime, and I hope everything goes well on that. So we really appreciate it. All the Omen people appreciate it, and the swings and basketball court were a good addition, if the swings get there. I like to see the basketball courts, you know? That's good. Basketball court was doing really well, and the kids really, no vandalism. Uh, I know you, we took off, uh, Keith took off the, the, the paddings for the, for the things for the winter, so they're they going to be able to be uh, reserved and so on for next year. Well, I know you're monitoring them over there too, so, yeah. you know, I got a good eye over there. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So one of the uh, largest increases in our budget absent large capital projects uh, has been within the police department, and a lot of it has been statutory. Uh, Illinois, new Illinois laws and legislation has caused a a uh, pretty significant increase in the budget of the police department for training. So uh, Chief Pappas is going to just kind of update the community on how that's affected uh, kind of the bottom line. So what we've done at the police department is we established what's called Training Tuesdays. The state has mandated a certain amount of hours that each officer needs to achieve throughout the year. It's actually a three-year block. And a lot of that stuff has to do with the escalation uh, crisis intervention, use of force, high-risk traffic stops. So officers in when conducting enforcement or any interaction with the community handle themselves in a proper way. And I'll tell you, um, we talk about, you guys see uh, in the public about use of force. For Glen Lights, we just had our last um, neighborhood watch meeting. We talked about how much use of force we actually use. And out of our arrests, the amount of force that was used on all the arrests that we had in 2021 was 0.02% of those arrests had to use force. So the training that the state is asking us to do is actually working. So in terms of Glendale Heights, we are way, far, we are way more advanced than almost every police department in the area in the aspects of training just because we have to do that and we want to do it. So not only this training mandates that we have to do by state, we are CALEA, which is an accreditation organization, which mandates the training that we have to do too. So 
our goal at a police department is not only to just meet the state mandate, meet the CLIA mandate, but also exceed that. So it puts our officers in more professional. Like Mr. Janeski had said, that's what we want. We want our officers to go out and do that kind of stuff. And I know Mike had mentioned it too. Some of a, um, an issue that we are also adding to our is more of a proactive policing. That includes any problem areas. I don't want just officers doing extra watches. I want them getting out of the cars and doing foot patrols in those areas. So we have more police uh, community contact. Neighborhood policing or community oriented policing is not just about the police officers doing it, it's working with the um, community. So that's why we wanted them more the foot patrol initiative. And that goes hand in hand with the training that we're talking about. In addition, what we have at the police department is our, our social workers. We work with an organization called NETFIS, Northeastern DuPage Youth and Family Services. The Glen Heights Police Department has four social workers on hand on Tuesdays, every Tuesday there are there's four social workers, two are full-time and one or two are part-time. Now for what we do is whenever there's a crisis um, incident that happens in Glendale Heights, our officers refer those families to NEDFIS, our social workers. And last year we had 200 and just under 300 referrals for social workers. So we're going to keep adding on to that. Our goal is to, uh, we are actually, we started this year, we put a third office in so we can meet the demands of our residents. So all that comes with a cost, right? So uh, the, all the training that's been added to every police department in the state by these mandates uh, is costing us about $50,000 extra per year in our budget. Uh, four or less training mandates than what we've had over the last several years uh, because we got to pay back for overtime, we got to pay for the training, we got to uh, pay per student for a lot of these classes to our training organization. So it's, it comes with a cost, but you know, training is never a bad thing, right? But it just comes with a cost. Uh, the social workers that we have uh, come on a grant. So we don't pay for our social workers. Right. We comes on a grant from Bloomingdale Township Mental Health Board Right, so essentially everybody who's paying property taxes pays into the mental health board and know that that's some of the best money that is spent from the township on the mental health board because that those social workers go directly back to Glendale Heights community and they're serving the residents of Glendale Heights and the township. Uh, we split that with Bloomingdale Police Department. Uh, you know, the social workers work with both communities. The grants for 135,000. 130,000. That's correct. 130,000 this year for the social workers, and uh, that's all grant funded to the police department. But uh, we've argued for years that that's the, the best return they get on their investment from the township is social workers in police departments working directly with our community, and they come out on crisis. They come out on calls. Uh, we have a program. George, talk a little bit about uh, what they do with. Uh, every other Tuesday with the social workers? So every other Monday, what we have is officers team up or partner with a member of NEDFIS, the social workers, and we do home visits. So sometimes um, residents can't make it here. We go out and we reach out to them. So it's more of a cooperation thing. We do not yet have where um, social workers, I know it's um, big in the public right now where they actually respond to calls. We do not do that. We do do the co-responder method for follow-up incidents. And that just, it seems to work out really well. It's well received by our community. So it's something that we actually like to do. Uh, another initiative that you guys have probably heard about is the flat camera systems. The flat camera systems are LPR cameras. We have 10 of them throughout the town. And what those do is if there is somebody that drives through and they have a stolen vehicle, they have a wanted, um, wanted driver, or if they have uh, information that's added on from a different police department or our police department, it's real time. It'll be real time activation. So as soon as that license plate goes through that camera system, it'll activate every phone and computer that's in the car and tell the officers that there is this vehicle that's in the area at this time. What we like about that is now the officers will know when there is a uh, criminal element that is possibly in the neighborhood. We have just had one that went live, and in that time that it went live, we had five different uh, alerts just from that one camera, and that was in two days. So they are uh, a very proactive thing for the community to know about. 
very, very minimal cost on it compared to the other systems that were out there. These are $2,500 a camera for a year, for the whole year, for one camera. So it's really cheap. When they had these in other um, municipalities, the LPR cameras, they were up to like, I think it was $60 million to outfit their towns for this. So a majority of the DuPage County agencies, towns are going to this flat camera system. Another thing that we can do with that is we share these cameras with other towns. So we all are sharing resources together. There was an article in the paper this morning, state police spending $12 million and they put cameras up and down every major highway just to try and control the crime that's on the highways. But also, you know, a lot of crime that happens here uh, comes east to west and then they go back east. So having uh, license plate readers out there will really help our detectives and our police department along with every suburban community uh, track uh, crime as it comes back and forth. Those cameras are the cars, right? So, uh, George, I'll let you answer. What was the question? Those cameras that you've been referring to are only in police cars. No, no, no. Those George, can, can you repeat the question? Uh, are those cameras only in police cars? No, they act, they're actually stationed, stationary cameras that are put throughout town. That's an excellent question, though. Um, if you guys noticed, the Glen Ellis Police Department, the officers wear body cameras. So the company that we are working with, Axon, for our body cameras also are in our vehicles. The next generation of those vehicle cameras will have the same thing that you're talking about, the LPR readers. So those will go in conjunction with the flat camera. So every time a police uh, officer drives down the road, that license plate reader will pick up all the license plates too. So it is conjunction with that. But right now the flat cameras are stationary, so they're at the different ends or we're stationary around the town, so they're at different areas of the community where we have seen an uptick in crime to try to prevent those. And we've put them strategically. please. Yeah, uh, Chief, are you gonna have any at the car dealers? So that's another good question. Flat cameras came off, of, originated from associations. So uh, homeowners associations, uh, one man invented this system so they can protect their association. Whenever an association or a car dealership opts to go for this flat camera system, per agreement, they have to share that information with the police department. So to answer your question, Mr. Pojak, when a dealership such as our Dodge dealer or Chevy dealer, if they opt to go for this camera system, it will add an addition to whatever we have as our resource. So if there's a criminal element that comes there, we had a, uh, not just London Heights, but every Dodge dealership, a municipality Dodge dealership, we had an uptick in car sales. There was a malfunction in what they did for the program for starting cars, so it was an easy target for criminal um, to get into it. If we had that system, as soon as they came in there and they were driving stolen cars, it would hit and then our officers would be able to respond. Can we get them to pay for the cost of that so, instead of the village? Yeah, so Chester, we are not paying for flock cameras to go on private property. No. We're putting them in public areas. We put them in subdivisions, George, right? Correct. So places that are in, one in, in and out. Right, we put them on public ways so that we capture license plates of cars. Right, it's not a people thing; it's a car thing. And but we're not paying publicly for us to uh, put on private property. If private property owners want flock cameras, they can pay for them on their own and get them on their own. And we'd happy to be partnering with them and do that. Are we going to offer that opportunity to them? They, they have that opportunity now. Oh, they do. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say because. These cameras are only on village properties. Because if we want to if we want to put one on North Avenue, we would have to get a permit from IDOT. Correct. And go out through the procedure to put one on North Avenue. Correct. So what we have done right now is we have tried to encompass more of our residential area. And they had Chester had mentioned the the businesses were going to right now leave that up to them to do We'd rather protect, or not rather, but we'd rather have them in the residential areas where our, our residents are living, and then we're gonna leave the onus um, to the businesses for their, to, put, to install their own cameras. And, Thank you, Chief. And another great thing that we do is the cops on bicycles in the summertime. Correct. And that is great. Correct, so that's, gonna, that's the other part of our proactive policing. If we have areas that we wanna hit, bike patrol, foot patrol. All right, thank you. So one of the other, um, Topics that's coming up 
is uh, roadway projects. Uh, every year we get grant funded roughly a million, 1.3, 1.5 million dollars a year to improve our roadways. One thing that we're looking at is how to uh, add uh, more money into our budget to fix our roadways faster, right? We have a 10-year plan on roadways. Those roadways are uh, reviewed by our village engineers as to the conditions of road and when they need to be fixed, and they've set a 10-year plan for that. Uh, the village is looking in this upcoming budget uh, to increase funding uh, to try and match our grant if possible, but to certainly increase funding to try and keep our roads up to date in a more efficient manner. Uh, so that's one thing that's on the table for this upcoming budget with some of our extra funding is to figure out ways to uh, improve our roadways quicker, right? And our sidewalks, uh, we're, we're moving to an in-house sidewalk program on top of the contractor sidewalk program replacement. We're gonna dedicate a lot of in-house man hours this year to replacing sidewalks that need to be replaced. So look for more sidewalks to be replaced this year. Uh, and not only just with our contractors, but with our own in-house uh, personnel. Doug, a quick question on that. I mean, with the streets, um, as far as doing like we're doing right now, where we're taking half of a project, doing half of it, and then breaking it up again for the other half of it for another year, I mean, it is making a, a big mess out of one small road or a road for two years running instead of doing it all in one fell swoop. I still think that's a huge mistake and it should be definitely looked at if we get some more money, if we could possibly do a complete road and be done with the project. So that's, that's part of why we need to fund more, right? To, to try and take care of larger stretches of roadway and not just kind of piecemeal those roadways together. And with the infrastructure that we have with, with the roads, we also I want to make sure like um, my, my ditch, my drainage ditch or whatever you want to call it, I know we had talked about that, looking into that, um, anything we can put towards that to figure out what we can do with it? Yes, and uh, trying to find a long-term solution to that issue is uh, part of what we've been talking about for the last couple months. Uh, we're working on that long-term solution. It's going to take a little bit of time and paperwork and legwork to sure. figure that out. Uh, but that is on our plan to try and keep the ditches uh, weed-free and tree-free and garbage-free. Tree-free and garbage-free. I'm sure the weeds are. Really yeah, we just did a big cleanup there uh, back behind, uh, what was it, Paul, Larry? Ardmore. 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 So yeah. we did a big cleanup there uh, just recently. Uh, how'd that work out? I, I want to go walk by it. And uh, Keith, how'd that work out? I, you know, it, it worked out okay. I, I got to walk the whole area, so it was... Uh, rough, ain't it? Uh, rough in the cold yes. in water, yes. Um, no, we had uh, some people go back and do some cleanup of that area. Honestly, the garbage was um, far better than anticipated. Actually, most of the garbage is located towards the fronts of those ditches. When you get back further, they weren't near as bad. But uh, we did a little bit of work on that and we'll continue to work with um, administration to come up with this policy and see what we can come up with to do something for the future. Good. And then we have... Yes, uh, you oh, sorry, Mayor. Yes. Well, go ahead. You want to finish yours? Or? No, go ahead. It's All right. I don't know if this is for you or for Mr. Coker. ComDev is losing a gentleman that is uh, quite needed in the ComDev department. Are we gonna replace that ASAP or what? Well, that's a question for another day, sir, if, if we could talk about that not here. Okay. Right, it's not really part of the agenda as far as personnel goes. Well, I was just right. curious about that because it's very important yeah, that's to me. Yeah, that's a conversation for another day. Yes. Okay, do we need, do, do we need special equipment for that, for that ditch line by, by Mike? Yeah. Uh, so for us to do that, uh, when we did it, undertook it a number of years ago, we actually brought in a contractor to do it um, and uh, expended, I, I, I got to be honest, I apologize, I don't remember the, the amount of funds. 25000 25000 uh, What our hope is, is that we can come up with a yearly contract similar to what we're doing with our landscape architects or whatever and having something done that maintains it on a regular basis so that we don't get to the situation where we're having to invest so much money in one shot as we go. Because the work that was done 
four years, five years ago, you can't tell. Was it? I, I, I don't. I don't know your district, Mike, but wasn't it the residents were supposed to maintain that right at, that's, the, at the very beginning, and then they decided. Yeah, yeah they let it. it then we're not going to do it no more. Yeah, they let it go. That's why we're looking at you know uh, contacting the residents. If I don't want to misspeak, Doug. It was an idea that was tossed around. Uh, well, there's a lot of ideas tossed around. Right. At the end of the day, uh, it, technically speaking, the areas that need to be cleaned up are private property and the responsibility of the residents. It's not reasonable or feasible for the residents to try and maintain that creek side. It's too overgrown. It's hard for them to get down there. You, it's hard to get a mower down there. There's... Um, there's native plants that aren't supposed to be uh, removed or killed that help with erosion and that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of there's a lot of reasons for us to to maintain that property, even though it's private property, <clears throat> to keep that creek flowing and to keep the debris out of it. Uh, the, the residents, uh, I understand why it's overgrown because it's just not reasonable or feasible for them, especially our senior residents that are there to try and take care of that area. Okay, thank you. Anybody uh, else from public? Hi, I'm coming again. I have the same concern as this gentleman just mentioned about the rental properties. Glendale Light is becoming more and more unfriendly towards the investors. Uh, whenever they do the inspection, even though the properties are old, we did not alter uh, alter the any infrastructure or anything. But they sometime ask to remove this and do this, even though when the property was sold, they did the inspection, and when the new owner came in and they penalized the new owner that you have to fix these these things, even though. The new owner has no idea what previous owner did it, and sometimes they say, oh, they did it uh, without the permission from the village or they have uh, no permit. So the new owner gets a problem, you know, and they have to go through so many things. I know the rental uh, license, you know, has to be in place because village is making money. Is there any way we can eliminate the inspection process and keep the rental license. I got it, Joel. Do you want to answer that? Yeah. Um, actually, the, the rental license is not in place to make money. The rental license is in place to maintain the property values of all residents of the village. So most of our rental landlords are very high quality and we don't have issues with, but we do have some landlords that don't maintain their properties. And to protect the property values of everybody, that's why there is a program, and that's why we do inspections. We also have an obligation to, to protect the, the tenants. Um, I'm happy to meet with you and talk about a specific issue. If uh, we do the, the license, we do the real estate transfer inspection, and then we do the, the rental licensing inspection. Uh, but it is really a critical component. Um, you know, there's, as I said, there's 1,500 single family plus 5,000 multifamily that we inspect. So I don't know every circumstance, but if there's a, a particular issue, I'm happy to, to meet with you and, and talk about that. But I just want to reiterate the reason we have that rental licensing program. I know a few of the people, you know, they just move out because of this inspection process and they move into the neighboring suburb like Hill Street, Glen Ellen, uh, Bloomingdale, you know. They don't have uh, that inspection process. So, uh, like every kind of rule and ordinance that comes about, there's a reason, right? And we never had this ordinance uh, up till uh, 15, 20 years ago. And the ordinance was put in place because of the amount of rentals that we have. And the housing stock was being devalued because rental properties, specifically, were not being kept up interior and exteriorly, right? We put a uh, policy in place, an ordinance in place, to uh, hold owners of houses that are rentals accountable to ensure that the housing stock of the village maintains value, right? As everything goes, right, and as that stock and value come up, right, 
we need to evolve as well. And we need to look and make sure everything we're doing is with the times, right? So we've been, they had a, they had a committee meeting uh, late in 21 to talk about revising some of the processes. But that's for the real estate. Okay. So, which kind of goes, but, it does go hand in hand yes. with the rental. Yes, and we need to keep evolving and sit down with the landlord and figure out, you know, what works and what doesn't work. But the, the purpose of the program was appropriate because it increased the value of everybody's house around it and doesn't allow for substandard houses to be there on the market and bring down the value of other people's houses, right? But as we evolve, we all need to evolve. We all need to check and make sure that everything is continuing uh, with 2022, right? And the landlords had a meeting last week, uh, actually earlier this week, yeah. still Saturday, <laughs> and people have that opportunity at landlord meetings to attend and talk about what works and what doesn't work for you, right? Unfortunately, three people showed up at that meeting and one was there mistakenly. So it is, you know, we, we have opportunities for landlords to speak out and come and talk about what's working and it's not working, right? Um, unfortunately, they're not doing it, right? And I appreciate the commentary here, and we can certainly work with you in the coming weeks to address your individual issues with that and look at everything holistically. Um, but the program's a good program. The program was put in place not for the landlords, but for everybody that, that isn't a landlord. But the issue is, I mean, no. Uh, if they are looking for um, certain things, which makes sense, I mean, you know, like uh, hazardous material or, you know, gas leakage or something like that, I understand. But window screen or uh, knob at the door. Yeah, so, you know, th those, so are not, those, those, are, those are things that we can sit down and talk about. And as everything's evolved, right, what's still practical, right? And, and that's certainly the time at the landlord meetings to address those or make an appointment with Joanne and her staff and she can sit down and address those. And she can talk to the board then about what they want to do with the ordinance. But, uh, you know, from the beginning, uh, it's, a, it's an ordinance that has really increased the value of everybody's house in, in the community. And so. if I could just reiterate, the, the landlord meetings are very important. It, that's really the, the best opportunity for you to come, and Doug said it. Um, there's in the invoice that you receive, there's the list of all the meetings, the dates and times. Uh, and then if we have your email address, we also send out an email to all landlords to remind them of the meetings. So if we, if you've filled out the application and we have your email address, if not, please let me, you know, we'll make sure that we have it and we'll remind you about those meetings because that is a great opportunity. We, we come to those meetings hoping that landlords will come and talk about these issues. Honestly, I, I have no idea it was there in place, so I will try to drive Yeah, it was Thank on you. your invoice, and, and you know, just give me your email address and strongly encourage that. Do you answer? Do you answer? Yeah. Normally at the property enhancement meeting, that's, right. you get about 8 to 10, maybe sometimes 12 landlords come. This time there was only two that ever came this past Wednesday night. I was very disappointed. Mm -hmm. They complain, they complain, complain, but then they don't show up to voice their opinion, any issues that they have. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just going to agree with Doug. Uh, that inspection, we have, got, we have a lot of good landlords and we have a lot of bad ones. And that, that inspection is for everybody. So that way, if, if you live next door and you're trying to sell your house, and the guy in the house next door to you is a rental, and it's all run down. That's not right. That's not right to a resident that been been in the village for maybe twenty years, twenty five years. He's a homeowner. There's a lot. There's a lot. There's a lot of things that you, you you have to consider. We have a lot of rentals that the people don't even live in the state. So I, I mean, and then there's some rentals that we have with two bedroom duplexes where there's six cars. You know, I mean. We have to we have to protect. I mean, no hard feelings. Do you? I mean, I'm not saying anything against against renter owners, but I'm saying I myself I have to I, I represent my my residents that live in my district, and and that's what I do. The homeowners, and like I say, we have a lot of good good runners. You know, we really do. But then that few that's in that you know, you know what they say? You put two bad apples in a in a barrel. And everybody has to pay the price. Unfortunately, that's what's happening again. Okay. 
Can I ask you to step back up to the right. mic? Hey, Mr. Right. Sam, please. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, my name is... Uh, One moment, please. Oh, sorry. sorry. If we could have everyone that needs to speak step up to the podium or ask for a handheld mic, um, just to respect that we are recording this meeting, and there's about 23 people on Zoom, and they can't hear you. So we want them to hear the whole conversation. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Not a problem. My name is Sam Lucenti, and um, my wife and I have been residents here for 28 years, and I'm also the uh, president of the board for the Glenside Public Library District. And I just wanted to you know, make a couple of comments on some of the things that have been happening out here. I mean, I, I'm very appreciative of the um, uh, cooperation that the Glenside Public Library District has been getting with the village. We're trying to do things together. In the past, it's been kind of adversarial. Uh, I'd say probably about 10 years ago or even before that. Uh, but now there seems to be some good synergy going on back and forth. And we want to continue working very closely with the board. And one of my agenda, one of my objectives uh, leading the board uh, is to have to foster this good relationship with the with the with the uh, trustees of the village. So um, it's it's great to hear what's happening here and the cooperation that's going on. Um, some other comments I had too. And that is um, more of what I've been hearing. Um, one of the things, you know, I was we talk about community development. Uh, one of the things that uh, my wife and I have been kind of disgruntled about is the fact that whenever we see new developments, we see these big white concrete buildings. You know, after we, we tear down a bunch of trees, we put down these big, we put up these big white concrete buildings and they stay empty. Uh, I happen to live behind the uh, the Glen Point, uh, uh, the business park, and half of those buildings are empty. And we're putting up more new big buildings, and I'm sure you probably have some sort of an anchor tenant starting the project. But there's just a lot of empty buildings, and it always kind of um, we always kind of look at that and go wow, why can't we have something that's a little bit more family friendly, as, uh, as Mike kind of said a little bit earlier. You know, my wife and I, for example, we go out probably three, four times a week for dinner. Never do we go to a Glendale Heights restaurant. We look for a family restaurant, and uh, we either go to Bloomingdale or Carroll Stream. You know, nice place you can sit down to, you know, not a big chain, and it's not like we haven't done it before. I mean, we used to be, uh, we used to go to Baker Square for the people who know, you know, who've been here long enough, or even the one where the Chase Bank is at. It was a nice family restaurant there. Ground yeah, Round. It was Ground Round. And we used to go there all the time. That used to be our two anchor restaurants we used to go to. Nothing. Oh, yeah, and another one is Springdale. I mean, yeah, okay, they put a pizza place in there, but it wasn't a family, it's not a family restaurant. You know, we, you know, and we hardly ever go there. I mean, it wasn't the same atmosphere. Pronto's is really good. I'm just saying that it's not the same atmosphere. We look for family <laughs> restaurants. I, I, I'm not here to bad mouth Pronto's, okay? But I'm just, I'm just pointing it out that, um, you know, we really kind of miss those kind of places, and they're just not there. So, you know, it's something to think about as you're, as you're making some of your decisions. Um, and that's all I had. Thank you. Sam, I got to say with the restaurant part, uh, Mike, with like what Mike was saying with the restaurants, oh, we, okay. we have always been very proactive trying to get restaurants in. I know we had, you spoke of all those great restaurants we had, but have moved out or closed. You know, it wasn't from, you know, it was maybe cost of doing business, not enough business. Maybe we weren't going there enough to support them. We did a lot of stuff to do that. I know what you're looking for is that, that little sit-down place. I mean, I like it too. Don't get me wrong. I spent a lot of time in good tequilas because I like their food, you know, and I, I try and shop within town. But the restaurants I know are tough. Not like we say no to a restaurant. We're always actively looking for someone, praying for someone that really wants to invest a lot of money and build it. And, I mean, I've talked to different restaurant owners, restaurant tours that – 
they're like, we're just not in a point right now that we can do anything like that. I, I noticed that this, is, this has been a theme. I mean, I, I've heard this over for the last few years. I mean, that everybody's trying to bring in a nice restaurant. I mean, even the previous mayor, I think, made it a point to try to do the same thing. It just doesn't succeed I, for one reason or another. I'm not blaming anybody, but it was kind of interesting to hear, I think, Mike talk a little bit about having people specializing in these types of things. You know, making it one of their, you know, not your 10% of your job, but maybe 50% of your job to kind of make that your, your objective, you know, for even being here in the village. I thought that was kind of an interesting idea. You know, maybe something worth noting in the future. Uh, because, I, you know, I think it is a problem. I mean, I'm gen we're, we're generating a, quite a bit of sales revenue for our collar counties, our collar villages, and it doesn't have to be that way. And it wasn't that way, I'd say, uh, uh, for quite a few, quite a few years. So See, I agree with you 100%. Believe me, if, if I want to sit down <laughs> breakfast and that, I have to go to Lake Street all the time. Or, or, Sh or Schmale Road. Okay. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of unfortunate. I'm only driving a mile and a half and I'm, <laughs> and I'm uh, not doing my business in Glendale Heights where I think that uh, that opportunity is really there. It's just that we have to attract and you know, I know it's not an easy job. So just another point to add to some of the other points that were made earlier. Remember the old coat of arms? Mm -hmm. Yep. I, I, I don't think I was there. <laughs> I've only been here 28 years. Oh, so. okay. I'm going, I'm going, I'm going farther back. I, I'm sure you probably are. Farther back than that. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Yes. Good morning, everybody. My name is Mike Falconer. My uh, question today is not necessarily aimed at the board, but at the uh, chief of police. My biggest peeve, and I walk my dog a lot, is seeing people speeding and just not paying attention to stop signs. I reported that on the evening of the 18th to the uh, dispatch. My house has uh, multiple security cameras on it. The officer came out. I showed them the video. They clearly blew right through the stop sign at about 40, 45 mile an hour in a uh, 25 mile, mile an hour zone, two of them racing. I saw another one that same evening on Schubert do the very same thing. And the officer told me, you know what's sad? We're not even allowed to chase them. I said, well, what the hell are we paying our taxes for? You know, I can't tell you how many times I'm out and I say, where the hell's a cop when you need one? If I see it, surely the cops must see it, but I never see them. I never see a black and white. They can actually, they, they can enforce a stop, but we do not promote pursuits. Okay. Yeah, the reason being is that we have to weigh, and there's, there's a, a, a matrix where the officers have to follow. They have to look at, is the chasing after that subject more advantageous or a, a disadvantage for us? Because just as we have all, everybody sitting out here, everybody has families too. Mm -hmm. if, that, if that person we're chasing crashes into a family, that is the, what we ultimately have to look at. Well, what happens if that person kills a kid? That's what we're talking about. So you're right. But you're, you're, without being chased. You're right. So the enforcement part of it, that's a whole different thing. So what we, there's a bunch of different things we do. We have a sergeant that just does traffic. So any complaint that we get for traffic, it's kind of interesting you bring this up because that's one of our uh, initiatives for this year. In, in our roll call, we... Um, I know David will put this out, but um, February 26th, we're going to have an open house at our police department so everybody can see what actually goes on in there. In our roll call room, we have a, a monitor that's kind of like that, and it sits up front so everybody can see. What we're doing this year is our town is broken out into four beats, plus we have traffic too. So when we have traffic complaints like this, the monitor will say is what the problem areas are in each uh, beat and what problem areas are for traffic wise. So every officer when they come to that roll call will see this. We also have uh, those speed signs. There are temporary portable speed signs yes, that we I can see. put up in certain areas too. And that goes in effect too. In addition, the flock camera system that we were talking about earlier, we have the cameras around town, but we also have one portable one too. So when we have traffic problems like this, we can actually put that flock camera system up there. But and what street do you live on? I live on President Street. President, okay. Stevenson. So I can add that, and I'll actually put it and give it to our traffic sergeant so he can assign that area, too. Mm -hmm. And like I, I was said, told that there would be more patrols. Right. 
So what they do is it goes to him. And I, I don't know if it is on the board or not. I can't tell you 100% sure okay. or not. But I can look into that, and I'll make sure that it gets done. Thank you. As a follow-up to that, there's a lot of vehicles in town with loud exhaust pipes. Is that something that's on your agenda as a noise ordinance? It depends on one than how loud the noise is, but loud exhaust, it actually, in one area of town, it was a huge problem when it was caused a, uh, a neighborhood issue, mm -hmm. but that's something that they can pull them over. There's different offenses that a vehicles can get pulled over for, and that's one of them. If the exhaust is louder than a manufacturer exhaust, they can't get pulled okay. over. Okay. Yeah. Good. All right. Very good. Sir, before you leave, yes. normally, if you can get a license plate number. This happened at 718 in the evening. And I wasn't able to get the plate, but there were two cars that blew right through that intersection. If you, in the future, if you can get a plate number, I, I call got up what, the chief. And I got what the cars were, but I couldn't get the plates because okay. I just was aware of, you know, these, these were coming eastbound on Stevenson, and I didn't see them until they got to the intersection. But I have a camera that looks right at that intersection on my house. So I found the footage, I called the police, and they said, it's interesting to me that they always say, do you want us to send an officer out to you like I'm about to go crazy because I've seen this? I said, no, I just want you to find the people and maybe give them a ticket, you know? They're speeding, they're not stopping, they're racing through town. I think there's even a race club going on. That's what I think. Oh boy. There is, there is different areas of the county that do have that, and what they'll do is they'll go to different shopping plazas. We haven't had them come to any of our shopping plazas in port or actually start from there. But there are different areas throughout the county that that has happened at. I believe it. Yeah. Okay. Chief, can we put uh, can we put our uh, speed sign? Yep. And that's what I was just telling him. We could throw the speed sign up there. I'll talk to the yeah, traffic sergeant. Yeah, I know. I know where he's at. He's right by the. Uh, yep. Yeah. We can get that done. Thank okay. you, Mike. All right. Thank you very much. George, there's also a comment on Zoom from Gallery Note Nine that there's also an issue on East Lincoln Avenue, right behind the police department. Okay. Christopher Epstein again. I don't know if this uh, is for George or uh, Keith. Uh, do you know how many AED devices we have at the various parks, or do we have them there? And because um, there are, a, there is a lot of grant money out there, and I think we could utilize those in the park settings. Uh, you know, for the safety of anybody if they get hit, and you know, have a heart issue or something like that. So I was just wondering, do we have them within? The outside park facilities inside? At this time, we don't. We actually just talked about AED devices yesterday, and that's one of the things that we're looking at. Um, and as you said, there are a number of grants out there, so that'll be something that we're looking into. Um, but I'm looking to put some money into the budget in this coming budget to have some at some of our bigger parks. And um, we also need to do some work inside of some of our buildings to change out what we currently have. So okay. currently, um, the police department just purchased 13 we did ours through grant, so we were able to go through a grant. We, we actually put in for two grants. One of them was Firehouse Sub, and then we went through another grant through the tobacco. Um, because through the tobacco grant, we were able to purchase AEDs for all of our police vehicles. But unfortunately, we weren't able to get the one from the Firehouse Sub, which we were going to use to supplement throughout the village. So that's why we have to go back for through the budget. So we went, did go through a grant, but we couldn't get both of them. So there's the squad, the, the police department has one in every squad car. And they, we've had them for ever. Uh, the ones that the police department just bought are replacements for ones that just, just kind of got old. The parks and rec department has 10 ADs throughout all of the facilities. There's not any at the parks currently because really there's no good way of securing them and then making sure that nobody takes them, right, because they are a couple thousand yes. dollars a piece. Uh, once we figure that part out, uh, but every squad car... Uh, has AEDs, and we save two or three lives a year with CPR and AEDs um, because they're in every squad car. Okay, and uh, another thing about the uh, speeding and everything, uh, there was an incident, I think it was a year ago, I was, me and my son were heading eastbound on Fullerton, and a car decided to uh, jut around us, it was right where the pedestrian stop is, by the camera park. There was a, a guy and his dog crossing, and that guy and his dog almost got hit. I gave the plate number and everything. It was a resident from Bloomingdale 
that had done that, but it was, I don't know if, you know, it was taken care of or whatever, but there is an issue with the constant speeding. Con you know, nobody wants to do 25 down Fullerton or anything. Well, I'm sorry, there's kids, there's parks, there's schools and everything like that. And uh, George, I do want to thank your patrols. They did respond to a safety issue with people parking too close to the, um, the intersection. Um, it was a day or so ago, and they, uh, we did see uh, presence left for the uh, vehicles there. So I thank you for your pro patrols uh, responding very quickly on that. Thank you, Chris. All right. I know there's a lot of speeding, George, on Fullerton. I get that. You can use my driveway if you'd like. You back them right in there because it gets them right at the low spot. They're not even looking. Okay, anybody else? Still, go ahead. Yes, recently I... Still, could you say your name, please? Still, and recently I heard about a dispensary coming to town and was wondering the pros and cons. I know one of the pros are the tax revenue, but also wondering what other good will come out of it and the crime that could be linked to it. I'll do that. All right, so the, um, the cannabis dispensary is a big topic, as you just said. The, the reason, the, the pro reasons for it, I know uh, like Mike Somerville will tell you that it, he doesn't want it because he, he believes it'll go to the, the, it's enticing the youth to use cannabis. The reason that the police department, so I'll go back, and you, some of you guys have heard me say this before. About six months ago, I attended a training, and it was Illinois State Police. And Illinois State Police controls all the uh, cannabis dispensaries. The, the sanctions that are put in place for a cannabis dispensary to be in business are huge. So, for example, for a cannabis dispensary to be in business, they actually have to have 200 to 250 to 450 cameras inside their facility. If one of those cameras goes out, the cannabis dispensary has to shut down because it is mon monitored by ISP, the Illinois State Police. In addition, each cannabis dispensary has to have a security guard on present, an armed security guard on present at all times while it's open. When you enter a cannabis dispensary, you need to have a driver's license that you have to have a driver's license. And if you're under the age 21, you're not allowed even in to go in there. <clears throat> At the police department, we do tobacco and alcohol stings, any establishments that allow to sell tobacco or, or alcohol. If they sell to a minor, when we do that <clears throat> alcohol sting or tobacco sting, it's a $75 to $150 ticket. If a person goes, we do, we do our cannab uh, cannabis sting at a cannabis dispensary, that business is fined a minimum of $50,000. Okay, that's just the regulation that they have. Now, uh, the reason that it would be a positive is that the because of all those rules, the people who are buying that cannabis are buying it from the state of Illinois cultivation centers. There is nothing but pure cannabis inside that cannabis that sold the cannabis dispensary. And last year, we had five robberies in town. Three of those robberies were because of cannabis purchases through the black market or the uh, criminal element. That causes more of a physical violence than any other thing. We still have cannabis arrests. We had 52 cannabis arrests last year. And those were for people who did not have a cannabis, did not purchase them through a cannabis dispensary. We have cannabis dispensaries in Addison. We have them um, in Lombard. They're around us, St. Charles. If anybody has a chance to go look at them, drive down North Avenue, drive across from Charles Cell Mall, you'll see a cannabis dispensary on the side, and it's called Zen Leaf. They, they're busy all the time. That is the town of St. Charles. There is between 35 to 50 cars there all the time. It generates revenue, not only for that business, but for all the businesses around there. If you look at that cannabis dispensary, and then you look on the other side of North Avenue, you'll see Charles Cell Mall, which is basically vacant. The only business that's established on that side of the road is that Cooper Hawk restaurant. So what from an economic standpoint, yeah, you're correct. 
But for a safety standpoint, I would rather have, if people choose to, because nobody in this room, not one person in this room was involved in making cannabis legal two years ago. None of us. But it is legal. I would rather have somebody purchase <laughs> cannabis from a cannabis dispensary where I know that it's safe, where they're not going to get robbed inside there. There's not going to be laced with fentanyl, which kills 60% of uh, overdose deaths were from fentanyl, or wiki sticks, which are embalming fluid that's put in cannabis. It is pure cannabis sold at a cannabis dispensary. I would rather have them, knowing that that's where they're buying it from, than have them buying it on the black market. If, if I could just add briefly to what uh, Chief has said, uh, was we've been working quite closely together. There's a couple other items that we do believe from an economic de development standpoint that that it is a draw. And so more people will be coming to Glendale Heights and that will positively impact surrounding businesses to have that there. Uh, and then there was quite a bit of discussion at the plan commission meeting. There's a disassociation of people that choose to use cannabis, Glendale Heights residents can go to any of these other communities to, to get cannabis. Lombard, St. Charles, Downers Grove, Lyle, Schaumburg, Naperville, all have. So there's opportunities to get it that if someone wants to use it, they can use it. Since that's all there and there hasn't been a demonstrated adverse impact of having a cannabis dispensary in the community, none of the other communities we've talked to have told us that they have any adverse impact then yes, the tax revenue is a benefit. All other things being equal, there's no adverse impact. It may help our existing businesses, and people that choose to do it are going to do it anyway. <clears throat> go ahead and allow that to occur. Sir? So, Syl, uh, the other departments around have not seen an increase in crime as a result of it. They have not seen an increase in the people are going to buy it and use it, or the people are going to buy it and use it. Um, it the only, the biggest issue that any department around us has seen, honestly, is parking, right? And not, maybe not so much today, but when they first came out two years ago, right, the biggest issue was parking because it was new, right? It's kind of leveled off now and parking isn't the primary issue. Um, but from a crime perspective, uh, you know, both of our corridors, there's 60 to 75,000 cars a day going through our corridors. There's not, it's not going to really increase traffic much because the people driving back and forth every day are going to be the primary people going to the place or they're going to be residents. That really isn't going to contribute to traffic too much. North Avenue Army Trail Road are two of, the bu two of the busiest roadways in the county, right? So uh, you're not going to see a huge, you're not going to see an impact really from traffic. There's not going to be an impact from crime, at least from around us. There hasn't been an impact on crime. Uh, you're seeing people actually move away from alcohol and move to cannabis because cannabis sales now are uh, the number one uh, sale versus alcohol, like by hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Um, so bringing a cannabis facility to Glendale Heights isn't going to increase crime or create other issues that people should be worried about, right? You can talk about the merits of it all. But we've given it two years to see how it all played out because we didn't approve it when it first came out. And right now, there's no I impact uh, from the towns around us that have been in it for two years. Uh, so we're looking to bring it forward and it's going actually to the board next week. Uh, Mr. Summer. <sighs> I hate to have my Don Quixote uniform on, but again, Michael Somerville. Um, I agree with what George just said, that my main concern is not my main concern, okay? Um, <clears throat> kids will get cannabis when they can get it, okay? Uh, you have people that are going up, driving up, and I don't know if they're going to be law-abiding citizens. They're not going to sit there and smoke their ca cannabis in the car and go out there and become a DUI, okay? You and I will differ on this. Okay, my problem is that a we have a police department that is pushing for marijuana. I have a problem with that, and again, it's my own personal feelings. It's my thing that I swore an oath to. Um, this is one reason why I said 
It's not a family-friendly business. We have, what are we making our revenue on? We're, we're soon going to be voting on a drive-up window for tobacco. We have alcohol. We have increased our uh, gaming licensing and gaming stuff. Now we're going to throw in marijuana. I know families that are broken up when there was legalized marijuana. I personally know of a family that a young man lost his family. He lost his child. He lost his wife. Become, they say marijuana is addicted, addicting, or not addicting, but it is. In my mind, this young man lost his family. And you talk about benefits of doing this. They're not going to come out and tell you. We have towns like Glen Ellen, Wheaton, Carroll Stream, Bloomingdale. They don't have it. Or if they do, they're, oh, well, we go for the tax money. Our business should not be relying on people suffering or people doing stuff because of marijuana. You know, years ago, we had to fight of what people thought about Glendale Heights and our children. And again, I've been here a long time. I've seen a lot of things change. And I don't feel like I'm welcoming Glendale Heights. I really don't. And again, I told you I'm my Don Quixote uniform out there. There's other people that feel like this, but they don't want to speak out. Or everybody's afraid of the cancel culture. I don't care. I can be canceled. I don't really care. I feel that marijuana and coming into Glendale Heights is not a good plan for Glendale Heights. I feel that, uh, Chester, I heard you, again, I'll, I'll bring, you, bring you personally. You said at a board meeting, hell, I never spoke that stuff. I never had that stuff around. Again, I don't think it's a good idea. Okay, it's money, money, everything. Why does that have to do with money? What about dealing with some of the problems? What is this? What are we going to get from this drug company? New squad cars? We're going to get them coming out and building our houses for domestic violence. What causes domestic violence? It's A, some type of addiction. It's some type of marital problems. Money. Look at the, inf we're now in an inflation. The worst economy we had in 30 years. We don't need two. Again. Two. What, let's go out there. Why don't we do this? Look at, look at the way the states are going. Look at the way they, what they're going to vote and change. What's next? Mushrooms? Oh, well, you just have a little part of heroin there. It's allowed. Okay. Look at California. California suspended their tax on it because they cannot compete with the illegal mail, uh, marijuana sales. And you're going to say that marijuana is going to go away? No, we're going to still have the illegal sales coming in this town. But I don't want the people think about, oh, this is Glendale Heights. They love gambling, they love marijuana, they love alcohol and tobacco. All things that I don't agree with and all things I don't partake about. I learned as a DARE officer, okay, marijuana was bad, okay, so they changed it, okay. But I do believe stuff can be done. This is science. OK, well, let's say they synthetic this and bring out what's really helped people with their illness dealing with it. I don't think they're going to stop driving under the influence of marijuana. OK? I, I, I arrested a lot of people under marijuana. It's a hard thing to prove. OK? But again, I'm not here to tell you. I'm here to tell you that I don't think the Glendale Heights should get involved in marijuana, okay? I don't really think it's a good idea. I think that we can do better, and thank you. Thank you, Mike, for your comments. Anybody else? <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, Mike, I agree with you 100%. Joanne and the chief knows I'm against this dispensary. I was against the, the betting, the slot machines. When it comes to the board voting for legal use of this, probably everybody will say yes except me. I will say no. I agree with you. I was brought up, you're not a lot older, I'm older than you, 
some of the other years. guys here. I'm 65 years old. Well, I got 20 years on you. <laughs> I, I got 20 years on you. We've never, never had anything in my time till now. Money isn't everything. My son lives in Ar Ar Arvado, Colorado. He's telling me about all the problems there with the drugs. It's terrible, and I don't want to see it here. That's all I got to say. Doug, I, I just want to uh, stick up for our police department. Our police department don't endorse drugs or marijuana. They were asked to investigate it by us, and the chief is doing his job, what he was told to do. I mean, our police department do not endorse any, any of that stuff, believe me. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, Mike, I usually agree with everything you have to say, <laughs> and I don't drink and I don't take drugs. But not having drugs sold here is not going to stop these children from taking drugs. It's like liquor, all right? Years ago, they had prohibition, and people had to sneak dr uh, drinking. Today, they can drink wherever they want. We still don't have everybody drinking, and it's the same thing with drugs. I don't care if, if drugs were sold in, in, in every restaurant. I still wouldn't take drugs because I don't want drugs. Wheaton, if I'm not mistaken, is a dry town. Can you honestly say that everybody in Wheaton doesn't drink? This is what I'm saying. Sometimes when you can't get something, you want it all the more. Personally, I don't feel that way. I wouldn't, you couldn't encourage me to take liquor or, or marijuana, but this isn't gonna stop these children. When we put the slot machines in, we were one of the last to put the slot machines in because we didn't want them in our town, but they were all over, all right? That didn't, so when we put them in our town, that didn't mean that we had everybody gambling. I still don't gamble at a restaurant. I'd rather go to the casino, but they're, that I will do, okay? But uh, the uh, mach <laughs> but the machines in these restaurants, they don't turn me on at all. So what I'm trying to say is people have minds of their own. If they're not gonna take drugs, I don't care where it's sold, they're not gonna take it. So I don't think us not having a marijuana here is stopping these children from taking drugs. I'm sorry, but I, I don't agree. I understand, I know what'll happen. You're gonna get a 25-year-old guy his neighbor is, hey, can you get me some drugs? I'll give you the money. He buys the drugs, and he gives it to the kid. I know that happens. It happens all over, and you can't say no, it doesn't happen. Also happens with liquor. Oh, yeah. Liquor is the same thing. So, I mean. But to reiterate, Mary, I understand that. But I can show you studies on the effects of marijuana on a juvenile's mind and the effects of stuff that has happened. Um, again, bring me back to my point. Parents, some parents do not take the responsibility to raise their child. And that's why I believe that it takes a village to raise a child. And as far as the, the, the police department, I understand. George and I go way back. We, we butted heads a long time. And again, we can always agree to disagree. That's, you know, that's what, you know, friendship. I've known him for when he was a little kid. Okay, I work for the police department. He's only thirty, so yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand it, but again, I understand where it is. Again, I feel as a former police officer that it's not going to go away, and it, th there's going to be problems in the village of Glendale Heights if this continues. Again, what is next? What is next that the village is going to get involved in? Thank you. Come on, sir. It was kind of an interesting I mean, rebuttal, but the one thing that I wanted to iterate a little bit is his theme, you know, being family friendly. And one thing is, as a listener in the audience, I was listening to, he, he brought up like a half a dozen different new projects coming up, right? And he mentioned drive up liquor, you know, another dispensary. And I was thinking about that and I go, well, that aligns with his theme of being family friendly, you know, why aren't we having the next six things on the dockets be positive things 
as opposed to negative things that affect family life. And I, and I think that, you know, I understand that, you know, if we don't put, have a liquor store in Glendale Heights, it's not gonna prevent anybody from drinking in Glendale Heights. Same thing with the cannabis. But to have two, I mean, I don't even know where the first one's at, or if, if anyone's actually in here. They're not. Uh, they're not here yet. But, you know, it, it's kind of interesting, you know, do we want to be the town that, that actually has two, and, and we want to have, no, you know, no. multiple liquor stores? I mean, uh, I'm going to throw on a number, 25% of our businesses are liquor stores. I don't think we want to have that kind of reputation. And one thing that kind of stuck out with me as I've been watching these meetings, and I'm going to go back to the previous mayor and quote something she said that's kind of stuck with me a little bit. You know, the village, the, the, the residents of the village have never asked her that we don't have enough public storage places in Glendale Heights. She said that one time in a meeting, and it kind of stuck with me. I'm going, wow, so you know, we're not just trying to make money here. We're trying to make this village family friendly. And I think that's really kind of what Mike was trying to get to in his core theme. You know, we need to look at those objectives as we're moving forward. So my two bits again, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? I think, I mean, no, I agree with both the gentlemen uh, that, you know, uh, we should not have any, any kind of a platform uh, for these kind of drugs. You know, we are actually facilitating, even though, you know, it does uh, add some uh, financial benefits to it, but uh, eventually, I mean, we are responsible for the youngsters. And, um, you know, by adding two of them or one, we are facilitating them, saying that, you know what, I mean, it's available here. It, you don't have to go to next town. Uh, it's right here. So that's all I want to know. I mean, I think <clears throat> it's very important that, I mean, we should keep the family values. We should encourage in having the family restaurants and family things. I mean, uh, so that more people, I mean, I have seen, I mean, uh, you know, people call me from other states asking me, you know, which state, which city is better. I always tell them Glendale Heights is a good place to live. But now, you know, recently, I am not giving them that kind of, uh, you know, suggestions. I said, you know, look at Lombard or Glenelg and I mean, other places because, I mean, they, you know, the taxes are less. I mean, there, there are many benefits to that. So I think, you know, we should focus more on bringing the businesses and uh, making this a family place. That's all, you know. Thank you. Anybody else? For, yes. Good morning. My name is Bob DeFinn, and I've been a resident here in town for 40 plus years. Uh, I just want to go on the record. I'm against the marijuana shops um, because you have the right to do something doesn't mean doing it is right. I see no benefit other than greed for money. I understand your point about controlling it, but we're encouraging it. One minute you tell our children, don't smoke, don't smoke. But you know what? Pot's okay. It, 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 my entire life I was told, don't smoke pot, don't drink, and all that stuff. But now we're saying it's okay. I just don't agree with it. So that's all I got to say. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Welcome. Yes. Anybody else or anybody on Zoom? No. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you for coming, everybody, and thank you, my staff. You are doing a wonderful job, and my residents. Uh, this is the first time uh, this meeting we are having. I believe it's first hap first time happen in the history of Glendale Heights. So I appreciate you know your comments, your coming over here, and my staff for joining and answering your question. You know. So with that, I need uh, mayor, motion. Can, yes, can I make one ahead. statement? If you could, we do coffee with the mayor and village board once a month. Um, Come out for this. This is another event just like this. It's a little less formal. You're not on camera, but it does give you access to us. I mean, we're all available by phone, by email, or whatever reasons. I mean, let it be heard. Stop out and see us. Call us. Talk to us. We're all here for it. So if you can, just come on out for a coffee with the mayor. You might get a donut, too, if you want one. But <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Next I, time, we will bring a donut for this meeting also. Yeah, breakfast would be nice. Yeah. Why don't you handle that? 
So I, actually, I was looking for Mr. Flint, you know, <laughs> for a few minutes. <laughs> I could not see you. Anyway, I need, uh, if, uh, if there is a motion to adjourn, a uh, question, go ahead. Go ahead, Chair, Motion to adjourn. Uh, second. 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 Uh, just, uh, just, uh, second is a trustee pact. And uh, uh, roll call vote, please. Roll call vote, Dave and Doug. Oh, huh? sorry. No problem. Doug's out of here already. Uh, trustee Light? Yes, please. Trustee Maritato? Yes. Trustee Pojak? Yes. Trustee Schroeder? Yes. Trustee Schmidt is absent. Trustee Siddiqui is absent. Uh, President Coker? Yes. Motion carries. This meeting is adjourned.